oral surgeon, all right? I don't know if that's a fancy name for it, but okay, so we're going to start with, I think, again, Ivy, let me just um, confirm this. I think both of you, we've gone over lock pretty closely. Is that right, Ivy? Okay. All right. Um, thanks for coming on. You look pretty miserable, but thanks for coming. Um, all right. Now, Locke's thing was we're all free by nature, equal. We have a right to life, liberty, health, and possessions. And our founders said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But they were very insistent on P, uh, citizens holding their leaders accountable in a material way. You know, you show me that I'm more prosperous because of you. Don't tell me about God. Don't tell me about some principles. I want to know boots on the ground. Um, am I better off? Okay. Now, if you take the document literally, when people say, let's go back to the founders, right? All right. So that's what this outline was about. Um, actually, let me start with what, e what you wanted to talk about, Alicia. Um, I don't know. I think the clearest thing for me uh, is that, you know, we, we talked about uh, some of our leaders wanting to go back to the origins and our Declaration of Independence, our government, our constitution is supposed to be flexible, but they don't want to be flexible in considering how Locke would come across in modernity, okay? Like he didn't think school or education was a right, but nowadays I think that he would. I don't think that they're applying him correctly in this age. Okay, so I've, yeah, I've said he would care about a middle class, right? Yeah, yeah. If it takes education to have a middle class, mm -hmm. it used to take 40 acres and a mule homestead, right? So when people said, keep the government out of my economic life, like the whole homesteading of the U.S., I was the government completely involved, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's how we became what we did. And that's why the Native Americans were kicked off. But I mean, the blindness and the irony, and that's why philosophy is important, is because People fixate on an idea and they can't even see what's around them in front of their face. Does that make sense, Alicia? Yeah. Okay. Now, Ivy, I'm not going to ask you because, again, I appreciate that you came and you look pretty miserable. But if you do want to talk, raise your hand. Uh, Warren. All right, Warren. Huh. Um, did Warren, did you find another time to take the test? I, I, I pushed it back. I spoke with the, the professor. Okay, good. The professor thought that was okay. Yes. Oh, um, good. I have a quick question, Dr. Beck. Sure. About about the, the because you saw the document I emailed, I attached to the right. email today, right? Right. And you're saying that I basically made a, a comparison between Bethams and Augustine. And no, I didn't. you didn't. Oh, because I was confused. That's right. No, the problem is that when we did Augustine, you were thinking of free will, right? Yes. And when you do Bentham, he doesn't believe there is such a thing. Yeah. Okay. And I so re I read. I read the document about. Yeah, about but it just your Bentham thing says. Um, let's see. Uh, then you'll understand it. And if we, this has a link, okay, I mean, I guess I got the impression, yeah, he says to me, I agree with him, but my reasoning is that at first it's about trial and error, and then you choose which actions, right? I mean, 
you can't agree with him and agree with Augustine. Okay. No, when I say when I say choose which actions, I mean when I say trial and error. So say for instance, you wake up this morning and you go to take a run at seven and you realize your body feels good. And then if you realize you wake up and then go take a run at 2 p.m., your body does not feel good. So it's then you'd say, okay, I want to do the 7 a.m. run more because I feel positive. It makes my body feel positive. No, That's what I, I, so I'm not relating it to um, um, to free will at all. Maybe but, the word choice there has you confused in a sense, but when I say choice, I mean... Well, here's what I mean, Warren. You say, if it brings you pleasure, you'll strive to keep it on the constant if it brings you pain. Okay. The thing about Augustine, he said, you're not, and Kant, you're not supposed to act on pleasure and pain at all, right? That's the temporal world. You're supposed to base everything on the eternal. That's all, Warren. It's not, I mean, <laughs> it's it just, just came across wrong to me. It just came across wrong to me. That's why, that's why I had to ask. It's okay. Yeah, Warren. Yeah. I just want you to, it's not your fault. There's anything wrong. I'm just, my issue, what I want the students to learn is that you've been handed down an intellectual tradition that is completely contradictory and extremely confusing. And it's embedded in the educational system. And so Americans, they jump sometimes they're, you know, being really Christian and very anti-sensuous and very judgmental and who's having sex and nobody should have sex. And, you know, just very anti-temporal. And the next minute they're calculating their pleasures and pains and they're, you know, obsessed about buying this or buying that. And it's just, it, it psychologically, it's a mess. That's, that's my point, Warren. Does that make sense? Yes, it, may, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me. I, it, was a, it was a misunderstanding on my end. Okay. I, I would say uh, that. My comment, yeah, my comment yeah. was misunderstood. Okay. This and is I, where I do want you to, to look at your what's going on in your psyche and go, oh, God, this is really crazy. But what my job is to tell you, it's the culture's fault. The culture has handed you all this stuff that absolutely doesn't fit together. And then when people get confused, it's like my, their fault. No, you know? And so that, that's kind of my main point. Um, but I'm glad Warren that you managed to come. So I guess we're going to start with, um, we're going to assume, I don't think Warren, the other two classmates, I went over Locke pretty closely with them. Yes. So it's just. I'll, I'll rewatch the recording because I realize it's recording. So I'll just rewatch it. Oh, OK. So you yes. understand the basic life, liberty, health. Yeah. I did. I did. I did. Um, I did submit the assignments for um, Locke yesterday as well. Oh. And the one that you told me to resubmit as well. I resubmitted the card document early yesterday morning. Okay, thanks. So I have everything turned in. So when I okay. saw that um, you said I should resubmit it, I already did it from yesterday already. Okay, did you know why? Because you didn't talk about Kant, actually. No. Yeah, I, I, I realized the, the first document that I submitted was just about the, the article. Right. And that, uh, that how that got submitted was because you remember I told you, like, I make my comments about the day when I come to class. Because remember, I spoke about the article in the class that we had, the last That's class right. we had. And that's how I got um, that document submitted. But I have everything put together that spoke about Locke and his views. And I submitted it yesterday early in the morning. Okay, good. That's great. Yes. Because yes. I, you know, I just, I told you, I, you were doing fine. It just, can you understand? It seemed to me like. Yes, yes. I, I okay. completely understand. Okay. And you're completely right to say so. Okay, that's great. And then the fact that it's not true makes me very yes. happy. Because uh, <laughs> I really like everyone to be on board and all of you are great. Okay, so I'm going to go through the founding fathers. And again, this isn't your fault, guys. You're getting completely messed up by our cultural tradition and the politicians are completely taking advantage of it. And so our political discourse is totally messed up. Uh, but all I can do is explain to you why. 
So let's go back to the founding fathers, okay? Yeah, Alicia, did you wanna say anything? No, go ahead. You just understand. I think the older you get, the worse it gets. But I thought, I taught this for a while and I thought, okay, I'm just gonna do this. Um, is our goal to go back to channel the founding fathers, which the Supreme Court now is based on that. It's called originalism. The, and I've read some of their mission statements about the way they approach it. They are absolutely wanting to go back to the minimal government as much as possible, especially with land use and environmental laws, okay? All right, why? Well, our founders were racist and sexist, right? Is that what we wanna go back to? African-Americans women did not have equal rights, not even remotely. <laughs> they couldn't vote and they couldn't have property. Um, our founding fathers believed in exploiting natural resources infinitely in an unlimited way, no environmental loss, and they are still obsessed about it. No climate change, we're supposed to ignore the facts. Okay, but our founding fathers were also progressive and they advocated a new kind of government and they declared war on the old worldview. And so now we're trying to imitate, you know, now we want to go back to, now we want to obsessively stay with our founding and not adapt to the times, okay? Is that what our founders want? Is that what they were like? Okay, our founders all, every one of the ones who signed the declaration, unified reason and faith. There are no Baptists on that list. Every one of them united reason and faith. This is really important, okay? The political documents they, they passed down show they wanted to unite reason and faith with almost an exclusive emphasis on reason, right? Keep religion out of politics or else um, wicked people, as soon as they talk about God, God wants me to do this. Everything collapses. The people are suckers. All of Europe is dominated by that. We do not want that, right? We are pro-reason, okay? Separate the, separate the way people think. And so thinking like a citizen is not the way you're taught to think at church. Religion is the foundation, you know? Jesus said, love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Great. Now let's go to the town hall meeting and figure out, you know, how we're going to solve our sewage problem or whatever and make sure everybody's treated equally. Because at church, you're taught to love everybody. Over here at the town hall meeting, everybody has equal rights, okay? Um, Three of them were Catholic. Um, so this was a rejection of the natural law tradition. You're moving into modern science. None of them were Baptists. Baptists were obsessed about separation of churches and state. They came over here to baptize their babies. All of the signers baptized their babies, right? They're paranoid. Don't no religion in politics. Um, what do you think they would do? Would they, um, they were progressives. They did not accept the customs of their day, okay? They did nothing because, you know, it's been done in the past. They threw away the past, right? Okay, so each person, the founders, among the founders, they had different views of the relation between reason and faith, but they all believed in God and immortality. And to some extent, they thought, well, John Locke thought you had to, to be a citizen. Otherwise, you couldn't be trusted in court or trusted to behave. Um, 
Okay, they wanted to train people to understand life as concerned, political life, concerned with the facts, right? They didn't want politicians to use God. Okay, they own slaves. Would they want slavery now? Would they still want slavery? Now that we know it's that they're it's empirically the case that African Americans are equal genetically, right? Would they want us still to have slavery? Because hey, that's what we had in the good old days. Now that we know women are equal, that they have equal capacities, would our founders want them to have equal rights? Or would they want, no, the good old days? What about atheists? They thought no atheists because they can't be trusted. That's false, right? There are atheists who tell the truth in court. There are Christians who lie. Would they demonize secular humanists? Would they not allow them to be citizens? Would they not allow them in court? Well, okay, it's up to you. Native Americans, right? Our founders thought they were justified in taking their land um, and homesteading it, cutting down the trees. They thought they were justified in killing them if they challenged it. They ended up you know, creating those reservations. What would they want now? Now that they know Native Americans are just as capable of citizenship, just as capable as anybody else, would they want them to have equal rights? I think so, but hey, it's not the way it's always been. Back to the good old days. What about evolution? Of course they would accept evolution because they, you know, united reason and faith. Evolution is one of the most fundamental scientific, uh, it's called a theory because it's been proven so often that it's even more than just a hypothesis. Um, okay, so would they accept it if it's been supported over and over and over? Of course they would. What about gay rights? They didn't know a dang thing about it. What if they found out that gay people are just as capable as anybody else? Would they want them to have equal rights? I think so, but hey, it's not the good old days. All right, what about guns? As a matter of fact, the Second Amendment, if you look at the commas, the scholars, the capitals, that it did not allow for anyone to buy any gun they wanted on the market. That is not what it meant. What about environmentalism, right? Founders, no, no, I work up the land, the fruit of my labor, nobody can come and take it away. This is a huge one right now because the politicians punch these buttons. Nobody can tell me what to do with my land. Nobody can, Steal tax me is basically stealing my money. I worked hard for that. Okay, so you cut taxes for the rich over and over and over. The rich get richer and richer and richer. Okay, that's what actually happens. Do we have the right to health? Do we have the right to education? Um, or is all of that stuff um, just taking away my hard earned, you know, money that I deserve because I worked for it. The founders were in a paradigm shift. They shifted everything, every way of thinking at their time. So what would they do now? Would they cling to an old, dated, dysfunctional paradigm? Or would they change? What about international law? They thought, you know, we're at war with every other state. They, they were isolationist, you know? We don't want anything to do with Europe. Is that where they would be now? What about empire building? Would they want us to build an economic empire? Um, okay, religious toleration. Okay, so if we take the founders literally, if we absolutely take them literally, originalists, we will have to deny citizenship to the following people, women, Africans, Buddhists, Hindus, Confucians, Muslims, Celts, Pagans, Wiccans, 
members of any other religion, secular humanists, moral relativists, people who believe in evolution, and immigrants. Would our founders want to prevent immigrants? Obviously, they didn't at the time. <laughs> they invited them all in. Okay. If we really want to think like the founders, how many current US citizens would there actually be, right? Um, all right, if we have to choose between government intervention in healthcare and education or minimal government and a shrinking middle class, what would our founders choose? They didn't have to choose that, but what would they choose now? So I want you to just, what do you guys think? Um, I think, okay, so when, when they first came over and started setting stuff up, it made sense for them to apply their ideas the way that they did. For example, I mean, they, they said that Native American religions weren't even religions. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, but if you look at that today, that's so obviously not what people believe and feel. So that is not what, in today's culture, the founding fathers would not do the same thing that they did okay. to the Native Americans. And I think it would be the same in several other, several different aspects. I mean, it's, the world is different. So their thoughts would be affected by the different facts that, that have been learned. They were on the cutting edge of their day, right? Yeah. They were radical. They got accused of all sorts of stuff, right? They got accused of being atheists just because they were tolerant. So today it's the same thing, but it's the liberals, you know? <laughs> I'm sorry. They were radical liberals, excuse me. <laughs> um, and so was... I mean, Martin Luther King ran into the same thing. Remember that? Mm -hmm. He was actually conservative, but he was labeled a radical liberal. Um, what about you, Warren? What do you think? I'm um, siding with um, what Alicia said. Basically, what I, was, I would say is things and times change. And what they did back then, they saw it right. And as time progressed, things change. And we realized that they aren't necessarily right now. And I think maybe if the era that we're in now, we were the founding, um, the, the founding fathers, the things that we would see right now, maybe in a hundred years from now, when there is a different Dr. Beck teaching a class like this, teaching kids like us, she would be saying the exact same things that you're saying because times then would be different from they are now. If we, we're in the era of the founding fathers. The laws that we set down now are gonna seem right to us because of the times that we're living in. So if we were to speak with them and say, okay, why did you do this? They would probably present us with the argument to say, okay, this is how things were back then. And then if they still see that they are right, seeing that how things are now, then we would say, okay, there's definitely a problem with them because we can't really blame them in a sense because it's how things were back then. But if they see how things are now and still have the same views, then we would say, okay, there is definitely a problem with them. Not to say they are good people to say, to say anything about them like that, but it's just how things were back then. Yeah, okay, so, so that's, that's my main point, right? And people who say, let's go back to the good old days. Let's go back to the founders. I just don't, I don't think that they know what they're talking about, right? Um, and the founders purposely left a lot of it vague and they had a case law tradition so that it would adapt. So that as things change, you would have a, a new case would come in and it would, it, you could make a decision that moved the country forward because people's experiences were starting to change. Um, all right. Okay, so yeah. then, as, as progressive as they were then, 
there's no way that they would not change their ideas with the times. With, I with think so. Of, yeah, yeah. I just, there's no way. Good, Alicia. But <laughs> what percentage of Americans, when they say, let's go back to the founders, have exactly the wrong idea? Mm -hmm. And that would be, I would say, three quarters of Americans or two thirds, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Over half, <laughs> okay. All right, so here's another one. Um, all right, so let's look at what's actually going on, right, in this world that we live in. Um, that there's an article about how greedy and impulsive we've become, right? Whereas the original, uh, you know, the Europeans who came over, supposedly they worked super hard. I mean, that's what we heard because they were given opportunity. So when people are given opportunity and they can move, their, move themselves to a higher class position, if they're given this land, they're given a chance, to not be working for some rich guy anymore, right? They're given land. I mean, all, a lot of people in Europe didn't have land because there were these big aristocratic leftover from medieval days, right? Estates. So of course they worked hard. And, um, but now, right? Are, we are in an impulsive society. Why? Because money was invented and um, in order to make money, uh, all sorts of advertising and the, the products, the way they're advertised, their effect on our psyche, their effect on our physiology is all designed to make us addicted, to make us impulsive. So that, you know, our structure of society uh, just keeps tapping the impulsive button. And it's changed the character of our country, the character of our politics, and the character, of, you know, our own character. So that that's important. Um, this one is important because I don't know if you've ever heard of the charity industrial complex, but this is really important that he sits on these charity boards and half of the donate, the donators are donating to nonprofits that are trying to solve the problems that the other half of the people in the world created. I mean, in the room created, right? So they're literally creating these problems and then coming up with these wonderful philanthropies to solve the problem and they get a big tax break, right? So there's so much evidence that plastic and pollution and all this crap that's making people money is leading to cancer, okay? And so, you know, people are making billions on stuff that's causing cancer and we have the Cancer Society, the Cancer Foundation, and I can get this huge tax break if I give money to the Cancer Society. <laughs> oh, God. Or um, all these foods that are, shown to be addictive, but now we have all these wonderful nonprofits to deal with people who are suffering from obesity or, oh, geez. <coughs> I mean, we're robbing people, we're depriving people of a basic humanity, right? When we don't give them a good education, then we have to, well, when we give them crappy food, then we have health care, and then if they can't afford healthcare, we'll have these foundations, these nonprofits providing it. Then we give them no, with no decent education. They can't get a job. They end up um, committing a crime. Then we have to pay, we make all this money on the prison system. And then we have these little nonprofits. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, right? And so, Peter Buffett points out that the society is structured so a few people get super rich and then they get to go to heaven by being generous. And, um, 
Yeah, I hope you read that. Um, Peter Buffett is a very interesting case. Did I tell you about Peter Buffett before? His dad, just his dad made billions just by being a reasonable uh, investment, investing in stocks in a steady, really steady, reasonable, really good plan. He just got super rich. And, but he never, they, they didn't live that way. They had a nice house in Omaha, Nebraska, and they had a nice house in Florida, but he didn't know his family was rich because his family didn't want that, which is exactly right. You should raise every kid middle class. Kids should not grow up with a silver spoon in their mouth because then they think the world owes them that. And so Peter Buffett knows that, Warren Buffett knows that. Peter wanted to be a musician. And he says, I was writing music and then my dad gave away his money. So I got a billion bucks and now I'm running this uh, philanthropy. But he said that when he went to college, uh, he didn't, you know, I went to college. Somebody said, are you Warren Buffett's son? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, do you know who your father is? <laughs> it's like, no, he didn't even know, right? He says, your father's one of the richest men in the world. And he did not even know it. So I say bravo to Warren Buffett. That's exactly right. Anyway, that is not the case for um, the Koch brothers, all right? The Koch brothers, and I've read two books about the Koch brothers. They are wicked, okay? They were raised to be hard-hearted, greedy, greedy guys. And they are fossil fuel billionaires. And they got rich by cheating and by destroying unions. I mean, I read the book on this, right? And a, and a big part of their wealth came from Minnesota, actually their oil refinery south of the Twin Cities. So they have spent their whole lives getting richer and richer and richer. They're obsessed with it. And now they're giving to political campaigns because the Supreme Court decided there, there doesn't need to be any limit on political giving. And corporations are human beings and have the same rights as um, people which enables them to donate and free and engage in any kind of uh, political rhetoric because you can't get arrested for lying in political rhetoric. Um, Donald Trump's lawyer said the other day, last week, it's not against the law to lie to the, um, to lie, let's see, to lie to, I guess it's not against the law for the president to lie. So yeah, the president lied. It was 10 to 13 lies per day <laughs> or misleading statements. But anyway, so the Koch brothers are all on board and this is not the way the Republican party used to be, honestly. The reason it's changed is the Koch brothers give all the Republicans money. They've just thrown their hat in with the Republican Party and they run the Republican Party. Um, let's see, well, they, um, it's become a coveted invitation for the party's rising stars, right? If you wanna be in this party, you've gotta go to his, organ his events and you've gotta convince them. So they used to have, um, they still have, okay? If their money, causes you to be elected. Then you go to these workshops or weekends for ALEC and they tell you what laws to introduce and what laws to change and what laws to try and get rid of. And it's all in their interest. And again, I don't like, I don't like saying stuff like this, but I did read 750 pages about them. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, I have some evidence. Then the other thing is the food industry. And this is really important too, because it's affecting our culture. And, you know, and this woman is about her farm. 
and the way that all the farms are being eaten up by mansions and stuff. And so this is what makes you think about what our founders, right? People were given homesteads, they went out and they farmed and they had these moderate middle-class lives and they traded their farming goods for the candles and the shoes in town and everything was peachy keen, right? That's where minimal government could work. That is not the world we live in. <laughs> All right, so any questions or comments on that? All right, but we still have a lot of that rhetoric is funny. Uh, anyway, the next one is Bentham, right? Bentham and Mill. So let's get started on this. And then we'll have time Wednesday and Friday. Okay, so we had with, here are the, the main movements so far in the modern world. So we have modern science. We reject Aristotle's science. We reject his worldview. We start all over. We're going to have reason, uh, rationalism of Descartes and Kant, which is dualistic, anti-sensual, a lot like Augustine's Christianity was anti-sensual. St. Thomas's Christianity was not because it incorporated Aristotle into it. So it's more humanistic, okay? So the Thomistic Christianity is more like humanist, although there are conservative Christians who, conservative Catholics who are more like Augustine. They're rigid and repressive. So there's some like that. All right, then we have this Protestant Protestantism and their view of God was God as the clockmaker, God is the, the clockmaker behind the mechanistic Newtonian system. That was Descartes and Kant. Then we had Locke who focused on the concept of right. And that's our political um, uh, tradition. But he was also an empiricist, the blank slate. So the utilitarians are the ones that really disagreed with Locke because they said, Locke, you're contradicting yourself. If you think it's a blank slate, then you have to appeal to pleasure and pain. So the utilitarianism is based on the real logical consequence of the blank slate. Because John Locke, you know, just think about it. It really is crazy. Okay, blank slate. And then we have these rights, right? We're born free and equal with these natural rights. That is not true. I mean, we might be born a blank slate, but we are born tiny little helpless babies for a long, long time. And so the environments we grow up in shape that blank slate. And the environments we grow up in, people are not free and they're not equal. They get molded within a context of inequality. Does everybody understand that? The utilitarians are going to be the real fact-based ones, right? None of you guys are really looking at the facts. We're going to be the real fact factoids. All right, here we go. Um, there were these reforms. So scientific revolution and the industrial revolution are leading to huge social changes, right? And so there's, there was this belief, you know, we're all going to have this middle class life, and it didn't happen. <laughs> money started sticking to money. And so then you'd have to have these reform movements. Okay, so he says, the historical context is science, scientific method, you all know that. Everything has to be based on the facts. Um, human beings, it, the fact is, human beings are the product of genetics and conditioning, mostly conditioning. So this is what you get, I think, in your psychology classes. Again, you can tell me what you get um, because different teachers might have different views and, and 
whatever you i'm sure you you learn a lot of different points of view i so i'm always curious to know how much of psychology at lion or in general is just based on genetics and environment and then various branches of it um there's more of an emphasis on genetics now because we know more about genetics but conditioning is still social psychology i think a lot of that is about social conditioning um all right and then they say as a matter of fact people grow up in situations of inequality and they're conditioned to believe in it right so a just society will try to raise children equally with equal opportunities because they're blank but they need to get molded equally because they're equally blank <laughs> right the key to equality is education um if there's a blank slate children can be educated to whatever the society wants them to become social engineering so now social engineering is a big deal right because people are molded back in the day when augustine thought free will they didn't think you know you can the whole point is going to heaven so you don't have to pay a lot of attention to what's going on around you because you always have grace divine grace and you can always get saved so these that was not a social justice position martin luther king was the one who said the churches should be involved in social change right now the but the empiricists the utilitarians would say yeah the intellectuals have to be deeply 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 engaged in social engineering because they have this capacity to condition people to be generous uh you know to have the virtues the virtues can be conditioned into people and that's the project that's the enlightenment project remember Kant was pretty idealistic for what you know teaching kids to use their reason but the empiricists are also very idealistic we can do this science and social science can do this um his dad was john's dad was an ambassador to india this is when the british you know india was a big british colony and um his friend was bentham um he wrote a book about his education his dad conditioned him from when he was six years old he, he started learning latin when he was three years old and greek when he was six years old and his dad put him through this huge education because he wanted to prove to those conservatives that intelligence iq is a function of conditioning not genetics right and i mean his son had one of the highest iqs ever recorded <laughs> but he wrote a book about that education because he realized after he grew up that not everybody grew up this way <laughs> and just like peter buffett you know um and so he talked about the nature of his education the thing that was interesting to me and i used to give you a give a quote he said nothing in my education was ever memorization and rote learning everything i did i had to come to the conclusion on my own my father never told me stuff he always asked questions he always followed up and followed up and followed up and so it was all very active learning which again is like yeah okay when are we ever going to learn anything um i do think we should read a little bit of history to learn from it but i think people say people who don't read history repeat it but nowadays people have agendas when they go to read history really mm -hmm. and so i think a lot of people read history in order to legitimize what they already think not in order to think critically and think about lessons that we need to learn so it's dangerous uh when people say you know you need to learn history because now that's completely fraught right 
Ah, uh, gal, that's been politicized. Anyway, greatest happiness principle. Actions are right in proportion as they promote happiness. And happiness means pleasure and the absence of pain, right? That's it. This is science based on observations. Um, whatever else we might want to believe, we might want to believe in God, we might want to believe in absolute morals, but we don't act on any of that stuff unless we associate it with pleasure and pain, right? The reason why we believe in God is because we're afraid we're going to go to hell. And so we have this, ah, hellfire, pain, right? It's pleasure and pain that, you know, motivates people to, to act on the idea of God is really the idea of pleasure and pain. Um, it's a subjective feeling in the mind. There's no such thing as a conscience, like you're born with these innate ideas. That was Augustine, right? The essence of conscience is all these associations we have derived from our sympathies, our, you know, our natural emotions that come from us, our love, our fear, um, all the experiences we've had, all the pleasures and pains and what we associate them with, all that stuff together, come, we come out with some sense of right and wrong. It's not based on character. So he's rejecting Aristotle. It's um, uh, all, all, all the word character should mean is that a person gets pleasures out of this and pain out of this and they act this way and they don't act that way, but that's it. There's nothing over and above your pleasures and pains and choices. Um, everyone seeks happiness, everyone avoids, everyone associates it with pleasure. How do you prove that's true? Well, everybody believes it. The sole evidence is that people actually desire it. That's why it's desirable. Yeah, there's no other reason. It's just a fact. The nature of pleasure. Now he says, it's an unquestionable fact. And I'm going to have to go pretty soon, I guess. Warren, do I have five more minutes? Um, I wanted to get through this. Yes, yes. Okay, what? Yes, yes, yes. Five, okay, I can take five Warren. more. I just want to run through this outline, and it should outrage all of you enough, or it should get all of you going, and then next time we'll start. And it's your reaction to this, and then your reaction to anything else. But the main punchline is that this is radically different, right, from Kant, and this is very different from Locke, and, and it's had an influence, right? You guys, <laughs> you're handed all this stuff, and it drives you crazy, so we have to sort it all out. Anyway, Mill says, it, the pleasures of the intellect, the emotions, the feeling of empathy with other people, and the arts, they are more pleasant than the pleasures of sensations. And you can prove that empirically. The people have been exposed to both will choose the higher ones. Uh, a being of higher faculties requires more to make them happy. Now, <laughs> does that mean nobody who's ever gone to college and has been exposed to an, a, an art course and a theater course and all this intellectual pleasures and all this wonderful stuff, nobody that goes to college will ever want to just be rich or just uh, seek lower pleasures, right? Okay, is that empirically obvious? I don't think so. And then the nature of happiness is not a life of rapture. Does this sound like the average American's view of happiness, okay? Um, and it's natural for us to desire other people's happiness. Is that, you know, I mean, empathy, we have empathy with our fellow human being. Most of the actions we do are for people we know, but we, we go from there to we want everyone's happiness. Why do people seem to prefer lower pleasures? That's my fault, you guys because it's society's fault, because my generation didn't condition you correctly. So if you really do want to just have 
pleasure, wealth, power, and glory. It's not your fault. You got conditioned that way. It's my fault. It's the elder's fault. What prevents people from being happy? A bad society. So all we have to do is restructure society and people will come out well, right? The feeling of unity is fundamental. Who's going to run this new society? Who's going to be the social engineers? Well, it has to be people that have been exposed to both of these pleasures. People like me, John Stuart Mill, right? Okay, so when you talk about social engineering, this is it. This is the foundation. This is the model. And so that's what we're going to talk about next time. So next time, I, I think I just have that one day I put all the posts for for this week on Mill and Bentham. I don't, I don't know. I might think of some more later, but we'll start out with the one I just did and then we'll do the Bentham one. And then we'll do, try to use Bentham to, to think about abortion. I have the Planned Parenthood um, reaction. And that's interesting. It's just interesting from a pleasure pain policy, public policy point of view. And then we'll go into some of those other ones. But please come with your thoughts. And thank you all for coming. I really had thought this course was going to just, I don't know, <laughs> unravel. I'm Thank you, Warren, for going out of your way. And thank you, Ivy, for going out of your way. I really appreciate it. Okay. Not a problem, Dr. Vick. Okay. Bye-bye.